We're going to show a video from Operation Christmas Child in just a moment. And after that video, um, Christina Callender from uh, Operation Christmas Child, she's an area coordinator. Uh, she's got a presentation that she wants to make to the church on behalf of Operation Christmas Child. So we want you to watch this video, get it in the back of your thoughts, because it is quickly coming upon us. And then um, Christina will come forward after the video is done. Honduras is a beautiful country. We have about 8 million people here. The majority of the people in Honduras are very young in age. There's great things taking place in Honduras. There's a tremendous revival taking place. Operación Niño Navidad is an opportunity that God is giving to the children of Honduras to be able to know Jesus Christ and to be able to know that God loves them. With Operation Christmas Child, we work with national leadership teams who in turn go and equip local churches, and the local church then can do outreach, evangelism, discipleship, and impact their communities for Christ. When uh, the shoebox is open, I am pretty sure many things are changing in their lives. When they uh, open the, uh, the box, it is an explosion inside of them, an uh, explosion of happiness and uh, enjoying this uh, this moment is is amazing i really love the distribution the kids are playing are laughing are joyful <laughs> you can feel the presence of god <laughs> After the children receive these shoe boxes, they participate in the Samaritan's Purse Discipleship Program, The Greatest Journey. We're seeing an entire generation being raised up of evangelists, of multipliers, of agents of mission, children sharing Jesus with their friends, with their family, and entire communities being transformed for Christ. Operation Christmas Child is doing an amazing work in my country. It's, it's something so special because we can see right now many life changes, families, and uh, all the population in my country is feeling, receiving, and enjoying the new hope through Operation Christmas Child. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Wow, there's more of you than was here before. Um, I'm I'm Christina Callender. I'm from Jackson, Michigan. You set this down here just a second. I might not be able to. And I'm the area coordinator for five counties. We have Eaton, Ingham, Jackson, Hillsdale, and Lenaway County that we I'm kind of in charge of. And your church has been doing Operation Christmas Shot. I was talking to Paula for way over 10 years. Um, I know I've been involved in about 17 years. And just as you see the shoeboxes, you guys have had a part in bringing joy to those children, but also the message that Jesus loves them and died for them. And so um, Honduras is one of probably about 130 countries that the shoeboxes have gone to over the last 20-some years that Operation Christmas Child has been doing um, and sending shoeboxes. And since you guys, a couple years ago, um, Operation Christmas Child decided we wanted to recognize our partners, which you guys are, in, in your help in sending these shoe boxes. And so 
they came up with, um, we were, we were going to recognize those that had done it five years. You guys actually have a five-year plaque as well, just so you know. I just didn't get here last year. And then you guys are also getting a 10-year plaque. So we just wanted to say thank you for your partnership all these years because you guys are the first part of that journey for all these shoeboxes. You guys are open to your community for them to bring shoeboxes to you. And then they come, they've been coming to Jackson and then we send them either to Minnesota or North Carolina where every single one of them gets inspected. And then they get sent out on ships. You saw all the different ways that we um, deliver these shoeboxes. And we just wanted to say thank you. Our goal this year for our five counties is I believe 22,000 shoeboxes. Last year, God bless us with about 20 thousand five hundred and that's just been in a, you know in the few years God has just multiplied it so we wanted to just recognize you so I'm going to ask the pastor to come up and this plaque just says thank you for your partnership every shoebox is a gift uh, every shoebox gift is an opportunity to touch a child's heart with the love of Jesus Christ and it says this is presented to First Baptist Church in appreciation of 10 years of partnership with Operation Christmas Child as an official drop-off location here's a few reasons why people don't go to church I can't come to church until I get my life together church is how I got my life together Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist. A little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really. Amen. Welcome to church this morning. Get your Bibles out. We're going we're gonna to jump right in and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 32. And if uh, you're using the Pew Bible that's in front of you, you're going to look for page 24. Page 24. And the message of my title this morning is Hanging On. And I think they'll kind of explain itself as we work through uh, the message for this, this morning. Um, but, but the point behind this message is this concept that we have all found ourselves at moments in life when we are overwhelmed. And we might explain them as the crisis moments of life, those, those moments where we, we were trying to, to look ahead and we'd say, you know what, I'm just not sure how I'm going to get through such and such. And, and the reason why I want to talk about this is because in those moments we've all struggled between that line of faith and fear. Okay, and, and this is what I mean by that. We, most of us in this room, I would assume, being Christians, we would say, I serve a God who is bigger than any problem I might ever face. And so we find ourselves in these moments in life, this crisis moment, this overwhelming season, this whatever it is that you're facing, and we would say, well, I trust God, but I'm still afraid. And this is how I know, because this is basic human nature. You say, God, I trust you. And, and what we'll do is we'll go to God in a moment in prayer, and we'll say, God, I'm finding myself in the midst of this circumstance that I can't quite wrap my hands around, or I can't quite comprehend, and, and, and I'm overwhelmed. 
I'm tired. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you want from me. And, and we'll pray for guidance. We'll pray for direction. And then we'll get up from that prayer. And if God hasn't moved as quickly as we expect him to move, we start planning and plotting and scheming and doing our own thing. Because let's be honest, none of us uh, very often think that God's timing is always great. As Christians, we would say, yes, his timing is perfect, right? That's what we would say in Sunday school. But in those moments, his timing seems anything but perfect. And when he doesn't start moving in the time you expect him to move, you say, yes, we have faith, but I'm struggling with fear, and my fear is that I'm going to be completely consumed by my circumstance. And what we'd all say during those moments is that we want a breakthrough. We want a turning point in our lives to where we just say, God, we clearly see you at work. I can see how this is for my good, how you might be working all these things together for, for good. But how do we get there? How do we get to that point where we can say, yes, I recognize that, and we can say with all confidence that, God, I know that you are in control. Let's pray. We're going to jump in. Father in heaven, again, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in your house this morning. Father, as we sing praises to your name, we recognize how good you are. Father, as we open your word, we pray that it would speak to our hearts and to our minds. We thank you for your promise in Isaiah 55 where it says that your word does not return void, but Father, it accomplishes, accomplishes, accomplishes your will and your desire. And Father, that's my prayer this morning, that your word would go forth and it would change hearts. And that, Father, we'd break down the barriers and allow you in to speak into our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to fully understand this passage that we're jumping into, into Genesis chapter 32, this is a story about Jacob, and it's a pretty well-known story. If you've ever been in your Bible any amount of time, most likely you've heard the story of Jacob. But to fully appreciate and understand this particular passage, you kind of got to rewind about 20 years in his life. And in fact, you really want the full story, you've got to go back to the beginning of his life. And, and I don't have time to give it all to you this morning, but if you want it, Genesis chapter 25 is where you can start learning about the life of Jacob and get some understanding as to why he finds himself at this point that we're going to address this morning. About 20 years before this passage, Jacob finds himself where he has made an enemy with his brother Esau. Remember when, when, when Isaac had looked at Esau and he said, go out, prepare me a meal, and then when you come back, I've got a blessing that I want to give to you. And, and, and Jacob's mom hears the conversation, so she tells Jacob, listen, why don't you go, why don't you go out and, and I'll cook some food, you go get some fuzz and some fur, and we'll paste it on you, and we'll make you smell like your brother. Basically what we want to do is we want to deceive your father so that he gives you the blessing instead of your brother. We don't want Esau to have the blessing. I mean, Isaac loved Esau, and, and, and Jacob's mama loved him, and so you kind of have this rift in the family, and so Jacob goes out and he deceives his dad. And he shows up pretending to be Esau, and Isaac blesses Jacob with the blessing that was intended for Esau. Now Esau finds out what's going on, and he promises that when he gets the opportunity that he's going to kill his brother. And so his mama finds out about this, and he says, I want you to go. I want you to run away, and I want you to go. I want you to go to Laban. I want you to go to my brother, and I want you to settle amongst his people because we don't like the other people that surround us. But we know if you go there, there's family. You can find yourself a wife. You can settle down, and everything will be good. And when things clear up, when your brother's temper subsides, when, when he learns to forgive you, I will let you know that it's safe to come back. And so what we have ultimately is a span of about 20 years. Jacob goes to Laban, and as he meets Laban, he, he, he meets this woman that he just absolutely falls in love with. What's her name? Rachel. Yeah, he sees Rachel, and he strikes a deal with Laban. He says, listen, I'll work for you for seven years if you give me your daughter's hand in marriage. And Laban says, yeah, all right, that sounds like a good deal. And so he works for seven years, and says it seemed like just a small amount of time. And they party, and they partied a little too long. Because at the end of the party, Laban gives Jacob his daughter, but deceives him because he didn't give him Rachel, he gave him Leah. And so he wakes up. Now, I don't know how on earth this happens. <laughs> he wakes up and he finds out, uh-oh, this is the wrong girl. How could you deceive me? And we, I tell you, this stuff's in the Bible. You should read it. 
It really, ha I don't know how this happens, but it's there. And he says, I wanted, I wanted Rachel. And he says, I'm sorry, but it's not our custom to marry off the younger before the older. Why don't you work for me for another seven years, and then I'll give you Rachel. Okay? And so he works another seven years, and he finally gets to marry Rachel. And he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah, and that creates some family problems. But while he's gone, away from his brother, while he's waiting for Esau, Esau's temper to cool off, he finds himself for the midst of about 20 years working for Laban, and he finds himself being deceived time and time again. And he kind of he kind of decides that, you know what, it's time to get away from the father-in-law. He has cheated me ten different times. He's changed what he's told me he was going to do for me. And so he decides to leave in the middle of the night with, with Leah, with Rachel, his family, with all of his herd, all of his flock. And then all of a sudden, the father-in-law finds out about it. And as Laban finds out about it, he sends men and himself. They chase after Jacob and his family, and they finally meet up with them. And as they get together, Laban accuses Jacob of all kinds of things. And Jacob says, basically, listen, I've done you no wrong. God is my witness. And so they make a pact right there in that moment. They build this altar. They build this, this um, uh, monument, so to speak, that creates a pact between the two of them. They decide, you know what, we're going to bury the hatchet. And they build this monument. And basically Laban and Jacob said, listen, if you come this side of the monument, Jacob, I know that you mean me harm. And if I come to the, your side of it, you can know that I mean you harm. And so this day, let's make a pact that says, you're not going to cross this line, and I'm not going to cross that line. And so as we come to this passage, Jacob finds himself in a very precarious, very overwhelming, very, very uh, volatile situation because he knows that he can't go back to Laban. And as he's looking ahead of him, as he's looking to leave, he finds out that Esau is headed for him. And so Jacob finds himself between a rock and a hard spot. I can't go back, and if I go forward, I'm afraid that he's going to take my life. And so with the inevitable ahead of him, Jacob, before these passages, you can go back to verses 9 through 13 on your own time, he prays to God and basically says, I am at the end of myself. I need you to help me because I don't know how I'm going to get out of this circumstance that I find myself in. And he prays that prayer and then immediately as soon as he is done praying that prayer, he falls in that same trap that you and I fall into all the time. God, I'm surrendering. But God, I don't know if you're really going to come through for me, so I'm going to take matters into my own hand. And if you look at verse 20, it says, you know what? I better develop a plan B just in case my God's not big enough. And what's his plan B? His plan B is to, as the words in the NIV say, I'm going to try to pacify Esau. In other words, God, just in case you can't handle this problem, I'm taking matters into my own hands. And all of this leads up to this very night that we're about to start reading about. He is afraid. He's afraid that everything that he's worked for for the past 20 years is about to be taken away from him. And he finds himself in a moment where he can't even sleep. How many of you can testify? You're so concerned with what's going on in life, you find yourself laying in bed and you cannot sleep. And before we jump into this passage, here's the concept. If you're taking notes... Here's kind of the main thought, the key thought for this morning. When you cling, a blessing God will bring. Okay? When you cling, a blessing God will bring. And we'll kind of unpack this as we work through this passage. But we need to understand exactly during these moments, what is it that we're supposed to be clinging to? What are we supposed to be letting go of? How can we be sure that God's going to come through to help us, to bless us, to do the things that He has promised to do for us. And so as we work through these verses, I want you to kind of keep that at the back of your mind. So with that, let's jump into verse 22. Verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. And so what we see here, again, is that striking contrast to the prayer that he just prayed, saying, God, I need you. And now we see the old Jacob coming and still plotting, still scheming, still planning. As if somehow or another, he's doing what you and I always try to do. He's trying to come up with a way to escape the things and mistakes that he's made in the past. Right? Don't we all think that we can kind of do it? Now listen, there's a difference between escaping what's happened in your past 
and overcoming the things that have happened in your past. It tells us in God's Word, be sure your sins will find you out. Listen, you cannot escape the past, but you can't overcome the past. But what we see Jacob trying to do right here is plot and scheme. Is there some way I can still... And so in other words, he's afraid that he's going to be attacked by Esau. So he's splitting up his family, he's splitting up his possessions. He made plans to send a lot of possessions ahead to Esau to try to pacify him, to get him to, to cool his temper about what had happened in the past. And now he's afraid for his life. He's afraid for his family's life. He's saying, God, just in case you can't come through... I've got plan B in mind. And so he finds himself not being able to sleep, and he splits everybody up. And then we come to verse 24. So Jacob was left alone. And I think this is one of the keys to this passage. There comes those moments in life where you've just got to get alone before God. You've got to get alone. You've got to get away from all the distractions that are going on around you. You've got to get away from those circumstances that are a little overwhelming. But it says right here in this verse that as soon as Jacob was left alone, that a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Now, if we're reading this for the first time, and we don't already know from the Sunday school stories and everything else, this man right here, it's very interesting because this, in fact, is not a man. In fact, this is an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. This is God himself who shows up to wrestle with Jacob. And I don't have time to fully unpack that, but if you want to write down the reference, Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 through 5, it helps confirm the fact that this is God. And by the time we get to the end of this story, Jacob realizes that he was with God, although he doesn't know it at this particular moment. He's left alone with a man, and he is wrestling with him, and he wrestled with him till daybreak. Now, we've got to understand this. There's some commentators out there, if you read them, they'll, they'll say, Jacob was so spiritual. He set his family aside, and he went back to wrestle with God until he got his outcome. The language of this passage does not dictate that at all. The language of this passage dictates that, that, that Jacob was afraid. He set his family away because he's terrified about what was going on. And I don't believe that Jacob was looking for a wrestling match, Right? He had Laban behind him as one opponent. He had Esau in front of him as another opponent. I don't think he was looking for a third opponent that night to get into a scuffle with and start wrestling. Yet, this is where we're at. Jacob was alone because he wanted to be alone. He, he, he wanted to try to wrap his mind around everything that is going on. And this leads us, if you're taking notes, to a couple of principles that I want you to gather as we work through this passage this morning. And here's one of the things, in those desperate moments, and if you've got the blanks there in front of you, God meets us at our level. It's important that we remember that because so often we get to the point where we think, before God will help me, I've got to get something straight in my own life. I've got to achieve some sort of standard of good, right? Some standard of holy. I've got to get away from what I'm currently doing if I expect God to ever show up and help me. Listen, God shows up at our level and meets us at that level and oftentimes shows up in the very way that is absolutely necessary. You ever notice that going through the Bible? Right? Remember when God showed up to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 18? Abraham was a pilgrim. How did God show up with his angels? As a traveler. Right? Remember in Joshua chapter 5 when, when God showed up again to Joshua? Joshua, who's a general, God shows up. How did he show up? As a soldier. Jacob's life has been defined by wrestling. From the moment that he came out of the womb, grasping Esau's heel, he has wrestled with everybody all his life. He wrestled with his brother. He wrestled with his dad. He wrestled with his uncle. His entire life is defined by wrestling and by that tough circumstance that he finds himself in. And so how does God show up? As a wrestler. Yeah, isn't that cool? I mean, God will meet us at our level. And we've got to understand, this is not Jacob seeking so hard after God that when God shows up, he just grabs a hold of him and won't let go until he gets that blessing. No, this is, this is something very, very different. This is God who wrestles with Jacob to get something out of Jacob. This is God showing up to wrestle with Jacob so he can get Jacob to recognize that, you know what, I have got to, I have got to come to the end of myself. I've got to see how helpless I am. And so what God ultimately is trying to do is to bring him to a point of submission. Look at verse 25 with me. This is interesting. This, this is where some of the arguments about this not being God actually come into place. In verse 25 it says, When the man, and of course we know that to be God, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that 
his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Now we look at this and say, well, now how can this possibly be God? How could God not overcome or overpower Jacob? In some translations, you might see the word there, prevail. But here's what's important, okay? It doesn't mean to obtain a victory like you and I would understand it to mean. It means literally that he was not able to accomplish his objective. And in other words, God is wrestling with Jacob, and for several moments he is not able to accomplish the objective that he wanted to accomplish, although he will. But he had not yet accomplished it. And, and you can tell, it says, God could have pinned him in a moment if he wanted to, because it tells us in the passage that he touched his hip. And in the moment that he touched his hip, it said that his hip was wretched. Your translation might say, out of joint. It literally means dislocated. The touch of a finger. But listen, this is where it's important. God wasn't looking to overpower and pin Jacob in a wrestling match like you and I might view wrestling. God could have done that very easily, but here's the problem. When you pin somebody against their will, you haven't pinned their will. Right? You could have physically won the fight, but he still would not have had Jacob's attention. He wanted Jacob to get to the point where Jacob was ready to yield to God. I mean, after all, isn't this one of God's primary objectives when he allows these trials and tribulations into our lives? Isn't his primary objective, as we read through the scriptures, to find out that he wants us to bring us to the end of ourselves? Right? He, he wants to show us that we are powerless without his help. He, he, he wants our attention, and, and ultimately, I, I believe it's because he wants us to keep from putting our confidence in the flesh. He wants us to keep from putting our confidence in ourselves and our own ability. And this is ultimately what we're going to find out he's able to accomplish with Jacob. But there's another point here that we need to recognize. And again, if you're taking the notes, it's this. God's strength is perfected in our weakness. As strong as we think we are, as long as we think we are strong, as long as we think we have all the answers, we will never submit and yield to God's purpose. And that's what he wants from us. That's what he's trying to obtain from Jacob. And he wants us to understand that, listen, as long as you think you're strong, you're really weak, because as long as you're working in your own power, you don't have my help. You don't have my assistance. And so if you really want to be strong, we've got to get to the point where we recognize we're weak. It goes against all logic. This is so counterintuitive that only God could put something like this in place. And But this is where we're at in this particular verse. He touched Jacob's hip. Jacob recognizes that, okay, something's wrong here. I can no longer wrestle. And it kind of leads us into verse 26. Then the man said, and again, who's the man? God. Then God said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And at this point, the wrestling is over. Jacob is just holding on for dear life. His hip is out of socket. Just think about the pain. Have you ever had that happen? I haven't, but I can only imagine how painful it would be to have a hip out of socket. Wrestling is over. And Jacob is just holding on. And what Jacob is discovering here is that you don't get anywhere with God by struggling and resisting. You realize that? You don't get anywhere with God by struggling and resisting, but you get somewhere by yielding and just hanging on to Him. This is where we get the, the, the title for the message this morning, just, just hanging on. But hanging on to, to God, not hanging on to our own wisdom and our own ways. I mean, Jacob's name up to this point has meant heel grasper, supplanter, deceiver. This is what has characterized Jacob's life. And he finally gets to a point where he recognizes, I am powerless. There's nothing I can do to hang on to God. And that brings us to this point right here, that God wants us to cling to him. In these moments in life, when you look at what's behind you and say, I can't go there. When you're looking ahead of you and saying, I can't handle what's ahead of me. When it feels like you're in a hopeless situation, God says, listen, what I want you to do is just hold on to me. Hold on to my promises. Recognize your own weaknesses. Understand, I'm going to meet you on your level to help you through the circumstance I've allowed to come into your life. You see, up to this point, Jacob was calling the shots. Till now, 
Sound familiar? Isn't this the way we do it? We want to call our own shots. We want to plan our own destiny. We want to feel like we are in control because it brings that sense of security, right? Albeit a false sense, but that's the way it feels. And when we recognize that this is what God wants, that God just wants us to cling to Him, when you're willing to just hold on to God, He's there and He's ready to help us. And we see that proven here in the passage. Look at verse 27 with me. Then the, mass asked him, then the man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Now hold on, time out. God had asked Jacob what his name was? Surely that couldn't be God, right? God knows everything. Why on earth would he be asking Jacob what his name was? You remember the last time Jacob was asked his name? It's when he was trying to deceive his daddy. His dad asked him, who are you? What did he say? I am Esau. Still deceiving, still plotting, still trying to figure things out all on his own. This is not the fact that God did not know what Jacob's name was. He was waiting to see if Jacob was really ready to change. What's your name? That's what he's asking. Are you, are you still Jacob? Are you still the deceiver? Are you still trying to manipulate people? Are you going to continue to live up to the name that you've had all along and continue to deceive yourself? Or are you really ready for me to change you? I think this is the thing he asks you and me all the time. Right? We go before God and we say, God, I surrender. I don't want to do this anymore. And then we get back up and we start planning and plotting and scheming. And God says, listen, I haven't come to help you yet because you have not truly shown me that you are ready for me to come and assist you. Are you still living the way you always lived? Are you still doing all the... So, so often, I'll draw this a little, a little bit more next week, but, but you know, we treat life like a, we, we've got this sin bucket, Right? And as we sin, it's like we're putting things in the bucket. And we plan to sin. That's why we need the bucket to hold all the sin. And then we ask God for forgiveness. It's like emptying out the bucket. And then we go back up and pick up those same things and put them back in the bucket again. Right? It's like a three-year-old trying to pick up Legos. Is that the intention when we pray? Jacob, what is your name? Are you truly ready for me to change you yet? And he recognizes, he finally has got Jacob's attention because in verse 28, we continue to read it. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob, I'm changing your name today. Jacob, you are no longer who you used to be because you have finally recognized how to win. You finally recognize that in victory comes through submission. Again, this doesn't make any sense, but you've got to yield to God. You've got to submit to His plan, and we've got to cling to Him. You know what's interesting here is the name Israel. Jacob, which means heel grasper or supplanter or deceiver, the name that he's lived up to all of his life, God saying, no longer are you Jacob, but you are now Israel. What does Israel mean? It means God rules. It means God commands. And what we see here is the birth of a nation. We see somebody who has finally surrendered to God's will. And so now no longer is it Jacob who is calling the shots, but now it's God. I am now Israel. God commands, and now I'm obedient to what God wants me to do. See, up to this point, Jacob had always prevailed. Jacob had always called the shots, and now he's ready for God to rule. He's ready for God to command. And then Jacob goes on in verse 29. And Jacob said, please, tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Why do you ask my name? It's almost as if, and I think this is so neat when you see God revealing his name to people throughout the Bible. If you ever want an interesting study, that's, that's an interesting one. It's almost as if God's saying, even if I told you what my name was, you still wouldn't comprehend it. Remember when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden? Uh, and they asked him his name, and all he said was, I am. And just that statement alone knocked them all down. I mean, even if I told you my name, he's saying you wouldn't be able to grasp it. So don't, don't, don't go there. But then it says, then he blessed him. Then he blessed him. Bring us back to this point. 
that when you cling, a blessing God will bring. Or maybe it should say, when I cling, depending on where you're at, when I cling, a blessing God will bring. When God commands, blessings follow. And here's, again, this is the tension. As Christians, we know this. We understand this. But why do we have such a hard time yielding? Because when we yield to God, we feel like we're no longer in control. Our pride gets in the way. Our sense of comfort, our sense of security, our, our, our sense of stability, it, it, it gets overruled because it feels like we're left so vulnerable. But if we're honest with ourselves and look back, how can we question God's goodness? I mean, has he ever truly failed us in the past? And then we've got to recognize that there's an upside to all of this. We need to recognize, you know what? We don't want to yield. We don't want to submit because we feel like we're out of control. But we've got to understand the reason why we're in this mess is because we've called the shots. Right? I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves. But things have finally changed for Jacob. In verse 30, it says, So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Peniel. Literally means facing God. Verse 31, here it is. Look at The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Look at the words I highlighted on this one. The sun rose. Tomorrow came. It wasn't the end. As desperate as it may have felt for Jacob, even though he felt like he's about ready to lose his life, lose his family, lose all of his possessions, it said that the sun rose, and what it's telling us is that the sun rose on a new day. Jacob wakes up the next day with a new name. He has been, he's been changed. Something's different. It's the dawning of a new day for Jacob. The new name meaning new things. He's got a new walk. Right now he's, at, now he's got the limp. He'll never walk the same. But it's a reminder of the fact that if you're with God, that doesn't really matter because God is going to take care of me. And sometimes we have a continual limp because of something that's happened in our life. That can't be the discouragement. That can't be what brings us down. It can't keep us from continuing on in our walk with God. It's just a reminder that we need God. And he goes forward with a new relationship with God. A new name, a new walk, a new relationship. Jacob was changed because of the encounter that he had with God and recognizing, I don't overcome by my own plans. By trying to figure things out on my own, I cling to God. And so we look at this and we say, so what? Right? It's great to have the knowledge, and again, I'll probably tell you this every week, we can't read the Bible without coming up with some sort of point of application, without coming up with something. What does this mean for me in my life? And again, as I always tell you, I can't tell you exactly what this means for you. I know some takeaways I can get from it, but just to help you think through it a little bit, maybe some of us in here this morning need to confront our past. Remember, Jacob is trying to run away from, from, from over 20 years of things that he used to be and the things that he used to do thinking that somehow I've got to be able to escape those things if, if ever anything is going to work out for the good. And for you, maybe it was a, a bad decision, a bad deal, bad relationship that you got into, and, and you're just thinking, you know what, that was the wrong move. Or maybe it's past sins, and, and you, haven't, you, you haven't yet, that past sin, that past experience that you haven't dealt with yet. Maybe it's a, a habit, maybe... Uh, it, it's just something that you think that God would never do anything for me because of this. Maybe it's the fears that need to be addressed. What if, what if, what if? We spend so much time, wasted time, thinking about what if instead of just surrendering to God and clinging to His will. And, and as you ask yourself these things, as you look and seek to move forward, we got to understand, listen, things will not always be perfect. As you look at Jacob's life, as you look at Israel's life from this point forward, he still faces other challenges. Other things are still going to come along in his life that are going to be difficult for him. But remember, now he faces them with a new name. He faces them with a new leader in his life. And we see things change. But we've got to recognize that, that we win by losing. 
You see that in this passage? We win by giving up and surrendering our own will, our own desire, our own ways. We surrender to God. And we do that, we win, we get the victory by yielding. And like Jacob, we can go forward in God's strength. And so why did God wrestle with Jacob? Why is God wrestling with you today? To get you to recognize that on your own, you're powerless. But if you want to face whatever it is that you're dealing with, you cling to God. And he's saying, I'm there for you. Now, we got to know what to cling to, but we also need to know what to let go of. And this is the other part that, that is very defining and helps us to understand this in a fuller context. But here's reality. You've got to come back next week to get that part of the message. We're out of time. If you would, stand with me. Roger's going to come ahead and lead us in one more song. And as he leads us, I want you just to internalize this message for a little bit. However God is speaking to your heart, speaking to your mind. If he's telling you anything at all, I want you to do business with God before you spend the time singing with us. Now, of course, we invite you to sing with us, but listen, it's pointless without the so what, without that point of application. So if God is speaking to your hearts this morning, I want you to be obedient, and I want you to respond. And if you want somebody to pray with, I invite you. You can come down, you can pray with me. Come down, you can pray by yourself. We'll give you the time that you need to have, but listen, don't walk through the doors without responding in some way to what God is doing in your heart right now. Regardless of where you're at in your relationship with him, trust him. He's got it. Let's sing. Let me just close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so grateful this morning for your word, the truths that it contains for our lives. Lord, we thank you for the promise that if we cling to you, there's blessing in that. Father, so often we, we, we cling to our own reason. We cling to friends' counsel. We, we cling to the wisdom and ways of this world, Father, just to find out that it leads us further and further into trouble. Father, I know that this morning there are people here who are struggling. They, they, they find, they're finding themselves in that impossible circumstance. Father, I pray that they would just hang on to you. Father, that they would be willing to, to let go of pride, that they would be willing to uh, let go of uh, tradition, they would be willing to let go of whatever it is that's keeping them from this relationship that you so strongly desire to have. And Father, I just thank you for the fact that if we're willing to do that, that we get to go forward in a new way. We get to go forward with your strength, with your promise. And Father, we don't have to worry about fighting the battle because you fought it and your word tells us that it's already been won. God, what an awesome promise. Thank you for our time together. I just pray as we part that you continue to, uh, Father, show us and reveal more of your word through the Sunday school hour. And as we go on through the remainder of our week, Father, just give us the courage, the strength, the discipline that we need to live and be the witnesses that you've called us to be. We ask it and pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.